So here behind me, you have a perfect example, and in front of me, you have a perfect example of desertification. This area was a primary evergreen forest. That means 35, 40 meter canopy, incredible biodiversity, always staying wet in the monsoon. It has been consistently cleared and cut away. And now there is no soil left. There are just rocks. Why is that? Because there's no organic material that's falling from the trees, which means there's no soil being made. And all of the water in the monsoon is directly hitting the soil, which is soluble and disappears. What stays? Rocks. Because there's so much water and because there's no organic material, the water is not able to permeate into the ground. When the water doesn't permeate into the ground, this happens. These channels start forming and eroding. And here, even more soil ends up disappearing and going off into the sea. So here you have a perfect example of somewhere that should be one of the most biodiverse regions on Earth looking and feeling more like a desert because we have consistently destroyed it. Why have we destroyed it? In this instance, it's supposed to be a cashew plantation, but as you can see, it's not a very productive one. Everywhere you have these lines where the water goes down and it's just taking away the land. Cajus. So this is the famous cajou. These are young cajus. There's slightly more mature ones here. And there's actually one fruit here, but without the nut. This is a cajou fruit. They come either in red or in yellow, and they're super juicy. So if you make a hole like that, and then squeeze, you get lots of this really astringent but very sweet juice coming out. Now, cashew was bought to Goa quite a long time ago by the Portuguese, maybe 400 plus years ago. And since then, it has become a really, really important part of the culture and heritage of this area but it is not actually native to here. Now, if you go to a lot of the old cashew plantations that the Portuguese raised 300, 400 years ago, you have massive cashews that really reach a good size. They create a closed canopy environment, which again, locks in the moisture. It means you've got lots of organic material like you can see here underneath the tree, lots of the leaves are coming down. And basically what that means is it can be quite a sustainable uh, agroforestry practice. Nowadays, people are growing primarily grafted trees rather than seed-grown trees. And nowadays, because the soil is like this, the opportunities for plants to grow are a lot harder. The environment for plants to grow are a lot harder. So where before you could raise these incredible cashew plantations with big trees that were creating hundreds of kilos of cashew every year, nowadays you're left with this kind of a sparse, almost desert landscape, frankly, with just little plants sticking out and around and the odd cashew tree. This is not economically productive. This is not giving back ecologically or environmentally, and it's not giving humans anything economically either. So it's not giving us money, and it's not giving us water resources, and it's not giving us biodiversity security or environmental security. Frankly, it's just a waste of space. It's a very sad waste of space. So cashew here, I should have, is nice. Cashew turns into firstly a juice that they call niro, and that juice is then fermented or distilled to become urak or feni, which is an incredibly potent, they call it like a jungle juice here, incredibly potent alcohol. Uh, and that has really become a, a very, very important part of the culture of, of Goa, especially in April and May. All of the rural communities end up having a lot of fun with the, with the urak and the feni. The nut, of course, has a very high value. And for that reason, it is also a relatively important export product for Goa. Driven, of course, by all of the people in the West that want to have their luxury cashew items. Here is where it's coming from, guys. Try and buy your cashew sustainably. And this is not sustainable.
So one of a couple of interesting things that are surviving, just notice it's surviving in this little crack. In this little crack, you've got lots of organic material and that organic material means there is at least some soil being manufactured and that gives all of these plants a chance to survive. What is here? Well, there's a few interesting things. This white flower, this is Jasminum malabathricum. So it's an endemic jasmine to this part of the world. And the flowers smell predictably a lot like jasmine. You can't smell that. I wish the camera were good enough to smell. Maybe in a few years we'll be able to do that. Anyway, it's a beautiful flower. It smells beautifully of jasmine. And these flowers are actually eaten by the sunbirds. Sunbirds are known as eating, drinking nectar, but they actually use these flowers uh, to feed to their babies. And we know that because they nested in Christina's room and she watched them do it for a whole year. So that's one interesting plant. If you look down here, this is another one. This is called, oh, I can't even remember what it is. Hollerena pubescens, is it? I think Hollerena pubescens. Here, this you have is Syzygium caryophyllatum. These are all native things, and that's a small tree. The, the Hollerena is a small tree. This Syzygium is a small tree. If we now go over here, we have one of the very adaptable forest, non-forest trees, sorry. And I'm going to be picking these fruits because they're delicious. This in English is known as Chironji. Here in Konkani or in Marathi, it's called Tsara. And in the rest of India, in Hindi, it's called Char or Char. And it really is an extremely delicious fruit. And actually, I'll be honest with you guys, I've not tried this. I've not eaten this fruit since 2022 when we left our last place because this was a tree that was quite common in that place. But it's not a tree that we had in the forest because it likes to have these more dry areas. So, you can see inside they have this very, very green color. Mm. Delicious. Taste is really good. And inside of the green bit, let's see if I can this is a seed pod. Now, if you crack that seed pod open, there's a small inside, soft section inside, and that is what is the Chironji nut, which is now one of these really well-spoken about superfoods. There's one more plant that I can just see here quickly and see, even in just such a little tiny patch, what diversity exists. Where here, it's basically a rocky desert, and it's not supposed to be like that. If you look in there, you see those really beautiful blue flowers? You see them? There. These are some, some species of Memicylon, which again, I think is an endemic of this area. So in what just looks like a real kind of messy little section, you have quite a few important species. And this is why the environment and the ecology and the biodiversity is just about managing to hold on. However, you put fire into this place, this will disappear. And this will then become like this. Now, we've just eaten the seeds of these. And in the same way as birds will eat them and then they will spread the seeds, we could be doing the same. However, if I put a seed here, nothing will happen. The tree will not grow because there's no soil, there's no biodiversity, there's no mycorrhizal fungi, there's no beneficial bacteria. It's literally a desert. And that is why we call this process desertification. It's a scale. So stage five is proper desert. This is like stage 4.9, we're super close. You've got little sections of greenery remaining, but if this carries on being aggressively degraded by various factors as it is now, fire, clearing, etc., etc., then very, very quickly, what is left of the greenery on this little tiny hill will disappear entirely. And at that point, you have a completely degraded, completely denuded desert, not an incredible rainforest. You want some? It's worth noting that cashews are highly toxic. They're members of the Anacardiaceae family, so named after anacardic acid. So this fruit is totally safe to eat. It's a little bit astringent, but there's nothing necessarily bad in it. This thing that looks like a cashew 
This is not actually the cashew. This is the covering, the seed covering or the covering of the cashew. The cashew is inside of this. If you take this and you bite into it, you will immediately get exposed to some black varnish-like acid. And that is incredibly uh, aggressive acid. It can burn your, your fingers. It can burn your mouth. It can even lead to blindness. Incredibly dangerous acid. So if you see cashew and you think, oh, I'd love to have or I'd love to taste a raw cashew, don't buy into it. These need to be, first of all, they need to be ripe. When they go ripe, they're a gray color. I wonder if maybe we can find one. These are still green. Once they go gray, you then have to roast them. And roasting them means putting them on a fire and letting them really roast out. Then you have to take the skins off. And even taking those skins off, you're going to get all of that acid on your fingers and that's going to burn as well. Only then do you have a cashew that you can eat. Now take a moment to think about that because the amount of cashew coming from small scale farmers is huge. And there's so many examples, not so much here in Goa, it must be said, but in other states in India and Sri Lanka and parts of Africa, where especially women who are the laborers that are unpicking all of these cashews end up having really significant health problems into the future because they constantly have this acid on their hands. So there is a consequence to all of our eating habits all of the luxuries that we take for granted and it would be really fantastic if as a as a consumer we had more license over what we're eating and also if we spent more time supporting the people doing the right things and the consumers and the producers that are trying to do their best for their planet and for also their staff and their local communities. So cashew demand is growing exponentially. Uh, because of trends, whole food trends, healthy food trends, veganism and vegetarian, looking for protein replacements, things like that. And that's fine. However, as demand grows, so does exploitation. Instead of the right people doing these things, it's the wrong people. It's the people that have all the money. It's the people that want to exploit land, exploit communities, exploit individuals for their own personal profit and not for the profit of the wider community and the environment. So behind me, you have a perfect example of an incredibly degraded ecosystem. You won't find any civet cats here. You won't find slender lorises here. You won't find porcupines here. You won't really find, you won't find tigers. You won't find gore. I could give you a massive list of animals that you won't find. So many birds, butterflies, reptiles, you're not gonna find here because this is basically a desert. And it's a desert because of, admittedly imperfect, cashew cultivation. Now, if we cultivate cashews properly, it doesn't need to be like this. It can be done in a way that is not so terrible and harmful and destructive and unprofitable. However, as consumers, we really need to be fighting for it to be done the right way. And we need to be fighting for the farmers who are doing all of this hard work to be getting the support and the education they need to be doing this the right way. Because if they do it the right way, their work is less and their profit is more and that ends up being good for them, and it ends up being great for the environment. There's another native here. Echno obtuser, that's the same as this. This is that, um, God, what's it called? Yeah, all these little plants, because you have a few birds coming in and sitting here because it's shady and cool, and then they drop all the seeds here. Everywhere else is just burnt and completely dead. Oh, there is a, I don't know what that is. Something, something that I don't know. And it's worth mentioning, here might look like a desert, and as you can see with lots of plastic and shit, but that tree standing there covered with creepers, that's an Elstonia scholaris tree. That is a 35 meter evergreen forest tree that gets massive buttress roots, and it is holding on. It wants to survive. Here on the other side, you've got the fishtail palm, and on the other side of the road, you have a bigger Elstonia scholaris. So right here, you can see all of the things that used to be here, that used to be flourishing, 
and yet also you can see just how much everything is struggling. This is like a very, very, very poorly cancer patient right now. It's not quite terminal. We have answers, but we need to start doing something fast because it won't be long before it's too late. And when it's too late, it's too late. <laughs> it's not a good place to be. 